But that's where your focus is, on things that touch the customer. Because you remember, one of the first things I've got to do when I'm going in and stabilizing the company is I've got to go in and talk to the customers. I've got to, I've got to get them to stay. And, and it's amazing how honesty really works well with customers. Hey, Dan, let me ask you a real quick question sure. on, on the customer part. So when you talk to the customers, number one, do you talk to the 20% that generate 80% of the revenue? How do you slice and dice the customer sector? You always uh, sector? start that way. You, you always start. You've got to start where the money is. Follow the money. You're, when, you, when you go into a turnaround situation, you're trying to generate as much cash as possible and stop in the bleeding. So the customers that have provided you a lot of your revenue, you've got to go in there first. And again, you go in there humble and mea culpa, but at the same time confident and looking in the eye and say, look, it, we screwed up, but we're going to fix it. And you're either going to believe me or they're not going to believe me. And, um, but yeah, you've got to start with the, with the high value customers. And then do you allow them to remain anonymous if they want? In terms of? Their feedback what they tell you you deliver that you uh, deliver that you back know, to the executive team that, when i've done when i've gone into companies as a consultant and done competitive analysis and customer analysis that yes one of the deals i make with the customers is i will keep them anonymous so the company will not know who said what but when i go in as a ceo um no i don't keep it anonymous i i um, I'd say 90 to 95 percent of the comments. I make sure that my organization understands who said what and where they're at because I want people. If you're a salesman for a company that um, said, "Hey, look at," we just don't feel like we hear from your salesman enough. I want that salesman to know it. Say, "Look at," increase the number of touch points. So that makes sense. Yes. Thanks. And now we talk about customers. You know, we mentioned it is. You can ever, never over communicate with customers. The key is to focus on quality, not quantity. And I was raised with my grandfather, who's still my hero. I tell people if, if I could ever be um, half the husband and the father and the businessman he was, I'd be somebody. Um, I am fall way short, but I learned so much from him where most kids sit on their grandfather's lap having Bugs Bunny read to them when they're three years old. I sat on my grandfather's lap having Horatio Alger read to me as I listened to records from Eddie Fisher and Eddie Cantor. But he taught me to be in the business world from day one. When I was eight years old, I was working in his office, and my job was a paperwork gopher. But also, as I sat in a lot of his meetings, and my job was to sit in the corner and keep my mouth shut. But then after that, he would ask me questions or I asked questions. And I'll never forget, he had a meeting one time, and my grandfather was not a statistician. He did have a college degree. I don't even think he finished high school. Um, very successful man in the real estate business. And, in fact, uh, he lived in Detroit and sold. You can tell people from Michigan, right? We all hold up our hand. We know what Verner's is, right? So he lived down here but sold property up here. I grew up in the boonies of northern Michigan, a town with about 800 people in the winter and 20,000 in the summer. It was a resort area. Um, but after the meeting, he walked out and he looked at me. He says, you know, Donnie, he's about 95% of the world's problems. War, divorce, conflicts of all sorts is based on poor communication. And I said, okay, knowing that uh, there's still 5% missing, Grandpa, what's the other 5%? He looked at me, he says, rounding error. Bottom line is, it's all communication. But communication is not enough. You want to interact. You want to engage. You want to strengthen that relationship. And I think, you know, Dan and I met for the first time, Dan Ricks and I, uh, was it last week, Dan? And, um, you know, I mentioned one of the things I try to do when I meet people for the first time is I try to accomplish three things. Most people only focus on two. One, I confirm something they know. That shows I've taken the time to learn their background. I understand they are a, uh, a software distribution expert, and I acknowledge that. Two. I try to inform them of something they didn't know, which shows my value, shows I may know something that they don't know. But here's the key one. Three, I try to have enough dialogue with them that I challenge them on something they think they knew. If I get to that third phase, now I've got a true intellectual relationship with them. I'm developing a, a relationship that's getting stronger and stronger. So and now we move to culture. And when you've got a distressed company, you've got everybody's attention. I would propose to you in the 1980s, I had a chance to work on the strategy to help bring Chrysler out of Chapter 11 bankruptcy. But the fact is, when a company's distressed, people know you have to focus, you have to pay attention. 
And um, I would propose that Lee Iacocca had an easier environment to make changes than he did than Buck Rogers, who went in as CEO of IBM, who at the time was the number one company in the world, and said, we need to make fundamental changes. And everybody's looking at him with these blank looks on their face and say, we're the number one computer company in the world. But Buck had seen the fact that IBM needed to get away from simply mainframes. He saw digital equipments, VAX computers coming up, the old PDPs. And he saw that they had to evolve and they had to change. And trying to get a successful company to change is far more difficult than a distressed company. So now you have an equal opportunity both to destroy your culture or evolve your culture. And I have seen some actually, in fact, uh, Jim Sachansky, I introduced him to a company um, a number of months ago. And Jim, I don't know if you agree, but it was one of the few companies I actually thought could actually put a quantitative value on culture, which I thought was extremely interesting. But I've always looked at culture kind of like love. You know it when you see it, but it's difficult to define it. But this is the time when you've got a distressed company to really evolve your culture and identify what you think is most important. Honesty, blatant honesty, painful honesty, customer experience, deliverables over hours, um, owning mistakes, communicating mistakes, going root cause. In my standard employee presentations, I tell people, as I mentioned to you, I don't yell and swear and I don't really get mad, but I do have two pages in there that says how I get perturbed. Page number one is things that perturb me. And I walk through some babbling gobbledygook about, you know, how I want them to operate, how I want them to conduct themselves. But then I have a second page, and it's entitled Things That Really Perturb Me. And one of them is making a mistake, not asking for help, and having it affect the customer. That's a non-negotiable. That's unforgivable. We all make mistakes. If you make a mistake in your culture, you have the right to ask for help. And as a team member, you have an obligation to help. And by the way, there's rights and obligations that I stole completely from Jack Welch and GE, which I think is very well. It's got five or six items to it. It basically says as a team member, here's my rights and here's my obligations. And one of those is I have the right to make mistakes. I have the obligation to ask for help uh, and document and never make the same mistake twice. With customers, I don't want satisfied customers. They're worthless. I want loyal customers. One of the first things I do when I go into a company is I buy a book and I give it to all my direct reports called Customer Satisfaction is Worthless, Customer Loyalty is Priceless by Jeffrey Gittimer. It's a very entertaining, well-written book. I, I've read over 100 books on quality and this is the one that I, I go to because it talks about the value of loyalty over satisfaction. A satisfied customer may or may not buy from you again. A loyal customer will fight not to switch. A Macintosh user will fight not to switch. A, a Subaru owner will fight not to switch. There's products that people are passionate about that they will not switch. Um, I walked into about a $160 million consumer lighting company out in California a number of years ago where I was asked to go in as interim CEO and, and, and fix it and get their revenue um, uh, processes fixed and all that. And I'm sitting there working and talking to all my direct reports as they come in one-on-one. -on -one. And my CIO comes in. And he looks at my Mac and he looks at me and he says, you know, we don't support Macs. And I said, you know, look, I've, world, I've used IBMs. I started programming in Unix, so I'm comfortable with most computing systems, but I like the Mac because everything just works. And I said, Leonard, the coy answer, it's a Mac. You don't need support. It just works. But I just want you to know I'm a Socratic manager. I don't think anybody's more important than anybody else. We just have a different set of responsibilities. And you're not going to find me doing this very often, but every once in a while, Leonard, I'm going to reach over and pull out this business card where it says chief executive officer. I'm going to hand it to you and say, deal with it. I'm not moving off a of Mac. Um, and that's what I've done. Um, I think so Don, let me ask you another question on, the, on satisfaction yeah. versus loyalty. What would you say the main, um, what's the main thing that separates satisfaction from loyalty? Is it, a, is it emotion? Say it again, please. What would you say is the difference between a satisfied customer and a loyal customer? Is it emotion? It's um, the loyal customer has taken the product or the surface and internalized it where it's actually making a, a, a positive personal passion impact in their personal or their professional life. And they don't want to switch. They'll fight switch. Um, they will, somebody says, look, I want you to use this product versus this product. And I say, well, I really want this product. I've used it for a lot of years. I'm comfortable. I like it. It works. Um, so it really is, is the fact that is they're an existing customer, they just, but they, they'll fight, not, they'll fight not to switch. And um, 
um, if you get a chance, pick up that book by Gittimer, and I can put it out in our thread so you can see it. But um, that's the big difference. Also, they will talk to you differently. They'll tell their neighbors about, um, oh, yeah, we had this company called Next Voice. It was a voice recognition company I ran years and years ago. And he said, man, they're just, they go out of their way to support me. I'm comfortable with them. Everything just works. Um, loyal customers will talk about you a lot more than satisfied customers. Satisfied customers, you send them a user survey and yes, they'll give you four or five stars and say a few things. Loyal customers will go out of the way to explain to the rest of the world that I use this company because of this. Um, in fact, if you go back to marketing, you know, in, in marketing, there is typically two criteria when you're trying to market to customers. There's order satisfying criteria and order winning criteria. Order satisfying criteria is kind of the jacks are better. You're going to sell them a car. It's got to have four wheels and an engine. Every car has got to have that. What's the order winning criteria? It's that which they personalize. It's red. It's a sports car or it's a truck and it's jacked up. It's whatever they do in terms of the product features and the service features to internalize and make it part of them. And they actually, the, the product becomes or the service becomes part of them, not just something they use. Does that help make sense? It does. Hey, Don. Yes. All of a sudden, I'm thinking about cigarettes. Um, I don't know why exactly, but wasn't there a commercial? Yeah, I, I'm, looking for, I'm looking forward to the segue here, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> was, wasn't there a commercial back when we were kids? I think it was some cigarette company actually had uh, the tagline, I'd rather fight than switch. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it's... Um, it was Lucky Strike. Yeah, Lucky Strike. Lucky Strike. That's going back in the days, but yeah, absolutely. Uh, third thing relative to culture, embrace technology. I mean, look what we're doing today. We have never even thought about doing this a year ago. But there's, uh, in my life, I've always had a natural affinity towards computers. So I buy gadgets. I try technology just to see if they, how much more productive they make. Um, I had the uh, opportunity when Steve Case was just getting AOL going, we were the very first ones to be able to use their file transfer system. And when I was at Ernst & Young in New York City, I might be in my home in New Jersey writing out a proposal, then I would send a file to somebody in California, call them up and say it's out there now. They'd work on it and they'd send a file to somebody in Connecticut and say it's out there now and do it. It was a very limited push technology, but we used that and it made us more competitive because we could knock out presentations um, over a weekend where other consulting organizations were taking a week or two weeks. So constantly looking at technology and embrace it. I believe technology is not there for technology's sake. It's there to make me more competitive and give me an advantage over my, uh, over my competitors. And finally, we, you know, we talk about the team. Avoid death of a thousand cuts. Um, I learned this the hard way is when you go into a company and if a downsizing is required, try to do it all at once. Don't do it here one month and then we're going to do another one and two months from now uh it just destroys the motivation destroys the culture and also if you've got somebody everybody likes old gus and old gus is be there a while but old gus is clearly not part he hasn't bought into the story he hasn't bought into the vision he's not going to be part of the long-term answer and some people may want to keep him around for another two or three months for continuity i've learned the hard way it's best for the employee it's best for the company to make decisions get them out of there quickly Try to be as compassionate and help them as much as possible in terms of finding a new job, but do it quickly because you got to start. As soon as you start laying off people, now you got to rebuild the culture. Um, another thing that managers have got to learn, and I've always focused at deliverables over hours. If somebody wants to put 90 hours in, God bless them. But I don't measure you. I don't evaluate you. I don't give you bonuses. I don't promote you on hours spent. I promote you. I give you bonuses, and I value you on what you deliver. And so it's going to be a whole focus, particularly with people working remotely, is to have them focus on deliverables. And there is as much a management challenge or more so a management challenge than with the employees. Managers need to learn how to do this. And they focus on, on deliverables.